Tilly, can you tell me, are we now live? I'm sure we, it looks like we are. We are like now we are. live on YouTube, yeah. Fabulous. Um, you may wish to contact um, Councillor Swift and uh, Councillor Evans. Uh, they're, they're not in the meeting at the moment. It's, um, it's possible uh, uh, IT issues potentially. So, uh, but we'll... Good evening, members. Let's uh, make a start. So, uh, so good evening and welcome to the Adults Health and Social Care Scrutiny Board on Thursday, the 11th of March. The nights are getting lighter. We're feeling a bit better. We're go hopefully getting back to some form of normality. So let's, uh, let, let's continue. Tonight, we're going to use the raise hands function. So if you go to the participants at the bottom, click the participants at the bottom. And on the right hand side, you will see a list of names who's in attendance. And there's a... a a raise hand element there. I'll try to take you in order, but sometimes as these things do, we, we try to notice these things straight away. But uh, my apologies if somebody uh, gets in a question before yourselves. So uh, let's continue with the agenda items. Um, so substitutes nominated for, for the, this evening and apologies for attendance. So I'm aware that we've got um, Councillor Rivon. Thank you, uh, Councillor Rivon, for attending again. And uh, she's substituting for Councillor Naeem. So welcome. Uh, to, to, to yourself, Councillor Rivon. I have no other apologies or no other, no other substitutes for this meeting. So we go on to item number two, uh, just to remind members to declare their interest at the relevant times, if there are any. Um, item three, admissions to the public. The public are most welcome to join us on YouTube. So anyone watching out there, welcome to the meeting. Uh, always welcome as, as, as uh, and appreciate uh, people viewing us. So excellent. So item number four is minutes of the Adults Health and Social Care Scrutiny Board held on the 4th of February 2021, a copy of which has been circulated. Uh, can we take those as a true record? Do I have a proposal for those? Anybody? Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor uh, Whitaker. And a seconder for those? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Lee, and all in, in favour. Thank you for that. Right, excellent. Okay, so... Item number uh, five, which is a uh, briefing to do with the street based lives. Um, so I'd like to welcome, I've lost you on the screen, Julia. Julia, welcome to the uh, Scrutiny panel and thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to come and, and do a, a short presentation. I think you've got something to share with us, hopefully. That's right, yeah. I'll try and share the screen now. Yeah, I'm Julia Caldwell. I manage the Safeguarding Adult Board and the Safeguarding Children Partnership in Calderdale. Uh, and we're tasked with undertaking the reviews of Safeguarding Adults Reviews, Safeguarding um, uh, Child Reviews, uh, Child Safeguarding Practice Reviews and Domestic Homicide Reviews in Calderdale. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me. Um, as I try to do this... <laughs> And if you can just let me know if something is sharing, that'd be fab. It is sharing. Yeah, we can see everything on screen. So, uh, so please. Well, that's it's fine. Yeah, as far as as far as I can see, it's fine. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, lovely. So if if I could bring my colleagues as well to introduce themselves. So, um, if Marianne, you could introduce yourself, that'd be fab. Hi, I'm Marianne Hewson. I'm the independent chair of the Safeguarding Adults Board. Um, whilst I wasn't the chair when this piece of work was commissioned, um, I've been very involved in seeing it as it has grown throughout the process of the review and understanding the fruits of its labour. So I'm delighted to be here to, to share this with you today. Thanks, Thank you for coming as well. Thank you. And Neve. Hi, everyone. I'm Neve Cullen. I'm a public health manager in the public health team in Coldsdale. My day job is uh, drugs and alcohol. And um, I've been the, I've written the review. Excellent. Thank you for coming as well. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so we'll press on. So the presentation I'm going to do today um, is I'm going to explain a little bit about what the thematic review is, what is a review. I'm going to explain what the timeline of this particular review has been. Um, we're going to hear about the life stories of the men uh, involved in this review, uh, look at the learning, bearing in mind you, you've had a paper beforehand looking at what those findings and recommendations have, have been. Um, we will either update you or introduce you to Making Every Adult Matter, um, and we will link it to Vision 2024 and tell you about our next steps. 
Um, and f feel free to ask questions. I can't see hands, Councillor Bagbra. Um, so if you want to tell me if there are any questions as we go through oh, that. I'll right. make a note, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, but there will be a lot, to, but there will be time at the end to ask any questions about the whole thing then once we've done the presentation. Yeah, I think if, if we go through the presentation first of all, then we'll take the questions after that. That's probably easy. So I can, I can see all the screens and otherwise it's, it makes it more challenging <laughs> to, to see all the screens. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks very much. So what's a thematic review? Um, so um, the Safeguarding Adult Board is funded um, by the three statutory partners, the local authority, the CCG and the and West Yorkshire Police. The reason for that is so we can have some independence to do things like this. Um, so a review is where there is a case where we think that there can be learning um, in that case. And in this particular case, it's about either the prevention or the reduction of abuse or neglect of adults. Um, very much the focus of a, any review, yeah. look at the learning, to promote that learning, to improve practice, it's certainly not to apportion blame. There are other parallel processes that go on that, that um, you know, coroners caught other things um, that, look, that look at those things. We are not there to do that. We are there simply to look at what the learning in the case is and how we can it possibly improve either single agency or multi-agency practice. Um, so those are the objectives that you can see. We establish actually what that what is going on, how, how people work together or don't, we, the synergies, the multi-agency working, we, we, we explore all of that. We look at how affecting actually our policy and procedures are, our training is, we look at the effectiveness of that. We look for good practice and what actually needs to be promoted even further. And then we look at obviously how to improve then further the, the, the interagency practice or service development needs. So that's the purpose and actually the reason it's called a thematic review usually it'd be safeguarding adult review but in this case there were there were five gentlemen that we looked at the case that the deaths of um so we're looking at the themes that have come out of that and actually trying to tie that learning together and so that's why it's a thematic review that's just the explanation for that so the timeline there's a little bit more detail in here um as Neve will explain, but um, the, we, the gentleman died at the end of 2018, beginning of 19. Um, and we were notified of the deaths in May 2019, which actually brings us to one of our first learning points, which is that nowhere um, are the, the deaths of men who, um, or women who live street-based lives reviewed or necessarily reported to for consideration of any review. So uh, that's the first learning point, and that's a national learning point. So many people up and down the country are, are in the same process. So where we'd have a child death, we would automatically undertake a review, whether it was expected or unexpected. In these cases, there was no kind of referral procedure or anything to, to come um, about these cases. So, that, so we, we got the case in May. We made a decision in June to undertake the thematic review, and we had the first meeting in July. Just I wanting to go through this timeline, so, mem so members are just aware of the process, really. So less about the dates, more about actually what, how we undertake the process. So in terms of reference, is the most important thing. It tells us exactly how we're going to run the report, whether we're going to get individual management reviews, speak to staff, speak to managers, look at chronologies, research. So the, the terms of reference is extremely important about how we're actually going to, who's going to be the author, how we're actually going to undertake the review. Um, most reviews culminate in a report, um, but it, it describes that a little bit as well too. Um, we also look at who else we're going to involve in this process, um, experts involvement, in more independent scrutiny, family, friends. And at that point, we can request the chronologies then. Um, and this is a breakdown of every single intervention in a specific time frame. And obviously, in this case, we requested five chronologies from each agency. Um, so there were about 10 to 15 responses from each, for each case. Um, so quite a lot of information we gathered, obviously. Um, <laughs> Um, following that, we held um, one practitioner event. So we know what the policy and procedures say. We know what's in the chronology and what's logged as actually what's how what the interventions were, when the, the gentlemen were seen, when they were referred on. We, we have all of that information. What we try and do then is we try and get the frontline practitioners 
in a room together at multi-agency um, and put to them whether the policy and procedures worked, if not, why not? Um, is there any gaps between the services? Why do you think they are? Is there anything that we could have done better? And then we do the same again with the managers. There's usually a little discrepancy between practitioners and managers based on the levels of understanding of, of certain things. Uh, and we obviously have to triangulate all of that. So we've got the factual information, the chronologies, the, the softer intelligence from frontline practitioners and from managers. Um, and altogether, what we what we kind of it culminates in is, is some lines of inquiry, some key themes that are already starting to come through about what my, our, our potential learning might be. So at that point, Neve then um, is looking at following up some um, individual organisations and saying, actually, can you tell me more about this process, you know, that your staff have spoken about, or can you tell me more about the problems, or, or maybe there are discrepancies between what's recorded and what staff are saying, and and we, we need to be um, have everything accurate in order to, to write um, a, a, an accurate review. Um, at that point as well, and Neve will tell you this, um, that there were other uh, organisations who were included in this review, um, such as McDonald's and Sainsbury's and, I'm sure, and, and experts by experience. I'm sure Neve will go into this. Uh, we then look at all of that, um, which informs the, 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 uh, the report itself. Uh, the report then goes through a few iterations. Um, first iteration is really trying to get to grips with the factual accuracies of those, trying parallel themes between the five cases. What is it that we're actually what looking at here? What seem to be the key themes or key areas of learning? Um, we consider at that point whether immediate learning for single agencies too um, and then um, as you can see between March and November there's a bit of a gap there and I think you all know what happened in March 2020 um, and just recognize that Neve and everybody who was involved in this review the, all of those up to 15 agencies all have day jobs um, and obviously they have to get on with it and do these reviews on on top of that so um yeah we've um we then went through a process of streamlining the report because actually as you can imagine in five cases um with the breadth and depth of information that we had um, and the learning actually that's, that's come out of these cases, the report was large, that we had to reduce that in order that um, it be readable. Um, and, and so reducing something is quite, uh, you know, hard to do. Um, so that that uh, was the next process that, that we undertook and really focused in on what those key themes, and as you can see from the report, that you've got those four areas of learning that we really focused on. Um, We've done the final sign off now um, and we have um, written the action plan and also what the content of the learning briefings is probably going to be. At the moment, the report has gone out for independent scrutiny. So because Neve works for Calderdale Public Health, even though she's removed from services and didn't um, obviously um, have the, the, the personal interaction, um, we felt that it needed to have the independent scrutiny. Um, so we've asked um, a clinician in the field who's well-versed and looked up to uh, nationally for, for working with people who live street-based lives, Dr. Nat Wright, and Lankily Chase, who are a national charity um, working with homelessness. Um, I'll hand over now to Neve um, about a bit of the background. Is that okay, Neve? Yeah, that's lovely. Um, I just thought it was important to start with with the men, and these aren't their real names, but um, I had to give them real names to be able to work with it. We couldn't ha couldn't have them as numbers. And the other thing I just wanted to say that you know Julia's talked about the length of time that it's taken us, but the benefit of working in Calderdale is there's been an element of almost like an action review, and there's been an awful lot of work undertaken, particularly through COVID, with this group to accelerate our learning. So, um, so it hasn't been put to bed <laughs> during that time. So, so these five men, one died late 2018 and the other four within a week of each other in January. Um, and that's absolutely shocking. Um, Manchester, London, other places wouldn't be used to the volume of four people in a week. Um, and as Julia had said, because I'm involved with drug and alcohol services, some of these men well, four of them had been in treatment. They weren't all in treatment at the time. So I learned of those deaths anecdotally. 
um, through my work and then informally through police contacts. There was no process. So um, we'll start with Jason. Um, Jason uh, died on the 15th of January. He was only age 36. He went into Calderdale early very poorly. Um, the, the hospital acknowledged there was a delay in his diagnosis and he died of sepsis the next day. But there was an internal inquiry and it was felt there was no um, prejudice to him being a drug user, but obviously that might have made diagnosis difficult. Zeb died um, the next day. He um, was found in the canal at Brighouse. Um, he was well known as uh, a character in Colesdale in Halifax, um, a drug user, um, an offender, um, and general man about town. Um, when they searched his address, which was in a temporary address, it was in a very poor state, uh, no electricity, and there was obviously signs of drug use there. Pat, um, who died age 46 on the 11th of January, most of us will have seen the tent outside Sainsbury's um, over that winter. Um, uh, Pat was one of two men there. He had been very, very poorly for a few days before he was admitted to hospital. And had feet pain from doses that then again became sepsis and he died in hospital. Lenny um, was aged 42. He, um, he died um, up outside the British Heart Foundation. He was sleeping behind there. Suspected he's overdosed, he was also very badly burnt because he'd been trying to light a fire to stay warm. Um, and then Peter. Um, Peter was found by the um, railway lines um, and identified through his wallet. And I think it's fair to point out now, Peter didn't have the same profile as the other men in terms of being somebody that we were used to um, seeing around town. But as it was felt important to include him into the review because a lot of the themes around interagency communication and its multiple vulnerabilities were common to him too. So it felt important to include him. And I think I've got a note on there at the bottom. I mean, if we look at the ages of these men, it clearly demonstrates health inequality. And, you know, the average age um, for homeless people to die is 44 for men and 42 for women in England. So a very stark inequality there. We move on to the next slide, please, Julia. <laughs> I think this is the biggie for us. The overarching theme is how we respond to people with multiple and complex needs. Um, you, the term is also used at the moment as multiple disadvantage, and, and more commonly it's been called that rather than complex needs. But Robin doesn't like it, so we're using multiple complex needs until he gets his head around it. <laughs> Um, and to describe that, usually it's a combination of homelessness. Um, homelessness or unstable housing, it might be sofa surfing, it might be constantly re moving in and out of B&B. Re-offending behaviour, usually very low level crime that never results in a very long sentence, so they're in and out without any support. Mental ill health, um, and often these people are victims of domestic abuse, maybe sex work, and often have huge debt as well. Um, they tend to be known to everybody, but served by no one, and, and often called hard to reach, and never feel like anybody's responsibility. And I couldn't find a Calderdale equivalent, but I just thought that map was really useful for us to think about. We've got reoffending services system now, substance misuse, housing homeless and mental health, and they are developed in silos. And our big problem is this client group need to be able to move across those, but we don't build them that way. Can we um, can we have a copy of these slides afterwards so that people can look at the, the details? I think it'd be quite useful. And, and, and just, you know, just for, for the next slides, just to give an over, overview. So we, I think, yeah, we can. Um, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's no, fine. And that's Nottingham, by the way. So Nottingham, not Calderdale. And I was thinking about how to describe it. So dual diagnosis, you might have heard the term a lot, where we talk most commonly about people that have problems with substance misuse and problems with mental health. And the only way I can describe what it's like to access healthcare is that if you walked into a &E with a broken arm and a broken leg, as opposed to substance misuse and alcohol, they wouldn't tell you to go home and deal with your substance, go home and deal with the broken arm and we'll mend the, de <laughs> we'll mend the leg today and then come back when the arm's better. And that, that's the challenge really that, that these people are dealing with. Next slide, please, Julia. <laughs> now, the report is big, it's been reduced and it's still big. 
And there's an awful lot of examples there, but I just thought it might be useful for me to pick out some examples from the themes to, to bring them alive a little bit. So if we look at access and engagement to healthcare and all the other services, there are some really obvious issues, really practical stuff like digital access, mobile telephones, literacy, um, often too many wrong doors for people to try and access. What was really interesting for me, and I don't know whether it's, it's a long time since I've done face-to-face -face work, there's a culture of not making referrals anymore. Most people are signposted, so it's left, it's their responsibility to sign, you know, to, to follow up this signpost and people don't. Um, and often, you know, with histories of discrimination and stigma, particularly around substance misuse, and, and, and four of these five men have had a lifetime of involvement with services and not always positive. So there were huge issues around trust and engagement based on the previous negative experiences. Um, appointment keeping is difficult, really difficult when you're living in chaos. But also, there's, we looked at agency policies, and there's a lot of inflexible policies that didn't play well for these men, whether it be lost prescription um, policies and drug and alcohol services, the eviction of Peter, which was a process that couldn't be stopped once it started, even though I think a lot of people would have liked to, and this thing around rough sleeper verification. To access rough sleepers service, you have to be verified and it's a very prescriptive process from central government. You have to be seen lying down in your bedding in the street. You can't be standing up next to it. And I can't see how many times we're sending out outreach workers to try and find people and how difficult it is to find them in the right position for verification. So like the hands, shall I ignore the hands and carry on? Yeah, if you carry on, I think I say we've got the, the papers as well. So we've had, you know, the, the comprehensive uh, briefs. I really, really want to get on to members' questions, I guess, as you know, okay. as, you know, as, as you can imagine. I, yeah. I won't, I'll, I'll whisk through. Yeah, no, it's super. Thanks, thank you. Huge and professional curiosity. I mean, Burnt Bridges was what we named the report because that was the idiom we heard all the time. There was a real sense that these guys had burnt their bridges with everybody. It was a sort of hopelessness going forward. Mm. Agencies, it was really interesting and revealing for me because I was I was interviewing paid professionals, but also as Julia touched on, these guys had had lots of contact with people in the community, with McDonald's, with the security at Sainsbury's, um, and the people in the market, and the community safety wardens, really interestingly. And it became a, it was very apparent a, a different approach. So in terms of these men's stories, I heard more about their stories from McDonald's, from Sainsbury's and from the community safety wardens who had been in touch with their families. Somebody actually went to the funeral. There was an awful, whereas the other side of the flip coin of that was, you know, staff are tired, they're desensitised, they see this all the time. And there was a lack of story there. I think there's something for us to think about in that. And of course, Culture and attitude, I attend lots of meetings across the system and I still go to meetings where we describe people as street beggars or rough sleepers or druggies and I think there's a challenge for us to think about the lens that we look through. We look at these people through. I think that the other big, big lesson that underpins a lot of this is our understanding of the impact of trauma on these men's lives. So even though we only looked back six months there was still quite a lot of information there that would indicate um, that these men had experienced trauma in childhood. And I don't want to do the, the, the science of trauma a disservice, but if I try and explain really simply that we talk about type one trauma, which is a single acute event, could have been a parental bereavement, can be an assault. There was evidence of that with, within these cases. And type two trauma, which is the more chronic long-term you know, lack of care from, from um, harm and neglect by caregivers, whether they be parents, whether they be social workers. And then when you put one and two together, you get complex trauma. And that really impacts on a sense of safety, on people's coping mechanisms, on their ability to self-regulate, which was key here, and certainly impacts on their ability to seek help and engagement. And experts talk about re-traumatisation, so all the time we're having poor experience and accessing services, we're 
handing that form off. What shocked me, and I hadn't anticipated, um, was that four of these men oh. had all had traumatic brain injuries. And it was shocking, you know, being hit with oh. looking at the A and E admissions. You know. And it was really interesting. So they all had these awful assaults, but there was never any reporting to the police and never okay. any reporting okay. to court. Access to suitable and sustainable accommodation. Um, we, we haven't got the specialist yeah. um, tenancy support to keep people Thank in support. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Goodbye. Sorry, I'll carry on. Um, we didn't, at the time, we don't have enough direct access accommodation to take people straight in from the street. There were problems with universal credit, and now that the money goes to the to the individual, the bills and rent wasn't being paid. Most of them had um, been excluded from social landlords because of huge arrears, um, a lack of basic life skills. One of the biggest barriers to um, maintaining the housing was chaotic drug use and alcohol use. And then, you know, these, what happens is they end up in, 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 in private landlord properties in hotspots in town, like Union Street, so I don't need to tell you about what goes on there. And then people are at risk of cuckooing where dealers move into their properties and they're exploited as well. So there's an awful lot to think about in terms of housing. Just touching on leadership, you know, that throughout this whole system, whether it be, you know, multi-agency working and somebody taking a leading role through to our system and where the leadership sits for managing this piece of work, there is an absence of it. Um, and it, we really do need a sort of cross-cutting whole, whole system approach. And, and this isn't about money, but we waste an awful lot of money um, with people ineffectively using services. And we looked, um, we used Trouble for Families Costing. We looked at the, the, the use of um, services by one man who's still alive in this cohort. And over a year, I think of 18 months, it was 104,000 in in, a, in in the use of public services, and 90,000 of that was in NHS and Yorkshire. You know, we could spend that money um, much more usefully. Interagency communication, I mean, a lot of this was quite practical, quite practical, electronic systems that don't talk to each other. I think it's been mended now, but certainly SWIFT and the GPs weren't able to easily share information. Even in the local authority, it wasn't always easy to cross-reference um, housing and social care systems. The use of flag and alerts was really interesting. We don't, haven't been using them to alert um, other services around the vulnerability of these, these men. It was generally the alerts are used for staff safety. Um, there was the issue of consent to referrals, which is difficult and people are hard to find and intoxicated. And referrals being made and then not followed up was an issue. And then the last thing just to touch on is that it's safeguarding. And I think certainly for largely the third sector workers, I think they felt they were very much left holding the baby, that safeguarding didn't really pertain to this group for them. I don't think they really had fully understood the roots in. Um, there was a kind of assumption in the system by some people that it was a lifestyle choice. Um, and that care act assessments were difficult to secure. Um, and not a lot of confidence in using processes like the Mental Capacity Act. But again, I have to say, through our work over the last 12 months, these things are improving already. And that next slide, please, Julia. And just, just to touch on this, that um, we applied to be a meme authority, which doesn't bring us any money, but brings us an awful lot of support in system change. And that started in April 20. So we have a, we have a rep that harnesses us, holds us to account, keeps us on a work program in terms of improvement. At the moment, we've been focusing first on pathway development into primarily adult health and social care. We have access to training, really good quality training, which will be free to us and we hope to be able to um, use across the system. Uh, we have learning from other meme areas. I think it's about 150 now nationally. And they're really good at how they're teaching us how to co-produce, how to co-produce with experts and experience. And I think I'll stop there. I can eat these yellow hands. Thanks, Neve. I'll just hand over to Marianne then now. 
yeah and I'll be really brief because I'm conscious that lots of questions are to be asked but uh, but I think um the theme of, of these these five men really was very much was hopelessness I think they felt that they were in a hopeless place and it makes really sad reading when somebody comments a friend of one of the deceased says the only thing that made him happy was taking drugs that's how sad his life had become and how hopeless he was in his situation um, and that's really at odds with the way that we as an authority have responded to the deaths of these five men um, and I think if we look back to vision 2024 and I've emboldened um, the parts that I think that really speak to me about this you know these are people whose voices might have been heard and they might have been in receipt of services as, as children some of them um, but have fallen out of services um, or are not taking up those services and perhaps they don't feel that their voices are heard anymore um, but actually we have seen throughout the report some real kindness um, from members of the public from staff at McDonald's and Sainsbury's, um, you know, where people have really tried to go out of their way to try and keep these people safe and give them a sense of dignity. Um, I think we've an awful lot to learn from these deaths. Um, and, you know, I think working with the agencies across the safeguarding agenda, you know, people generally come to work to do a really good job and to safeguard people but are frustrated when they haven't got the resources or policies set there isn't a policy that applies and actually for all of these men no one agency could have solved the problem um, a number of agencies and the communities and public sector as well need to come together to safeguard um, these people and to change the way that we view their lives and the way that we enable them to access the services that they so desperately need um, so that they can, like everybody else, live that larger life that we aspire to live. And, and again, going back to those statistics that Neve quoted earlier, you know, when people are dying in their early 40s, when the average is 70s and 80s. I think that's really sad and that's a massive inequality in our society and something that we really need to take seriously and do everything we can to level up um, for the benefit um, of Calderdale as a, as a place generally. You know, we will thrive um, as a place when everybody thrives. Um, so that's where our focus um, as a safeguarding adults board has, has got to be in making sure that these people that are vulnerable because of the situation that they find themselves in, because of their life experiences, that we make sure that we keep them safe. We show them that kindness and we help them to develop that resilience and to recover from the setbacks that they've experienced. So turning that hopelessness into hope. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll hand over now for um, Julie, are you going to talk about next steps or are we going to take questions? Yeah, I'll just quickly, because I think maybe questions might be about this too. So I'll just say um, that once we've received the feedback from those two independent scrutineers of the report and its findings, we'll incorporate that. And obviously it might affect our action plan and what we do. Um, we will have final sign off by the Safeguarding Adult Board then at that point, which will mean that we can publish the report. It'll go on our website. We've been asked for the report from Michael Preston Shute, who has, is undertaking reports himself in Kirklees and in other places, uh, and is kind of leading on, on this work and bringing the learning together. Um, so we are going to be collaborating because uh, up and down the country, everybody's having this learning. Um, and so we're not going to, you know, reinvent the wheel. We can, you know, take good practice and what, what's been done elsewhere, where it fits with Calderdale. Um, so we'll be doing that sharing of regional and national learning. Um, we are going to go through a process, whole process of briefings, training staff, written communication, videos, probably lots of different things to try and get the messages from this learning out succinctly and not in an 80 page report. Um, we'll be doing that and then checking to see actually whether that learning's gone out. So we'll be at a, a certain point auditing, re-looking at cases, seeing if they've been improved. 
um, seeing if they've changed. A lot of this is not easy work. So, you know, we're talking not just about putting some training on or challenging a policy. It's cultural change. It's people's thoughts and feel, you know, th this is a massive change. So, you know, we're not under any impression of tick boxes here. There's definitely a journey we need to go on. Um, we'll gather the feedback from the staff about how that's going, but from service users too, from families, from communities, and see actually what difference this is making, this, this thematic review and the learning from it is making. We always have what are called challenge events where we very much look at the recommendations from this report and challenge staff and managers about exactly whether this information has been disseminated, embedded, whether there's new learning in fact. So we did this, we changed this, we thought we'd improved it, but actually there's new learning. You know, there's other things that have changed that yeah. need looking at now. So we always do that with any review. Um, we've got an action plan that we need to monitor and we're going to report and obviously the assurance of all this goes through to the safeguarding adult board. Um, we did have a thought, and maybe for this is for the questions and discussions about what the involvement of the scrutiny board is in this, you know, corporate parent style things or, you know, the, the kind of decisions, the, the high level decisions about funding and things like that. So, you know, we did have a think um, that that's probably a discussion that might need to be had in future. Um, I'll stop talking and I do have a slide saying any questions, but I will end the slideshow if that's OK with you. I hate to say this, Chair, but you're on mute. <laughs> Chair, we can't hear you, sorry. My apologies. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> but as schoolboy uh, number one for, for the evening, my, my uh, sincere apologies. Thank you, Julie, for, for sharing the uh, information. Uh, thank you, Neve and uh, uh, Marianne as well. So, and uh, it, it must have been quite challenging, Marianne, to uh, to you know come in as chair in in the middle of all this, uh, in the middle of the the actual report itself. So, uh, so yeah, well, well, well done. It's. Uh, Quite, quite a task. I've got a few people uh, that have raised their hands. Uh, first of all, equally, I'd like to welcome Councillor Evans to the panel. I can't see you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're here somewhere. Uh, anyway, welcome to the panel. Yeah, thank you. I can see you uh, right in the middle. Uh, so I'm going to take Councillor Swift first, if that's okay. Just need to unmute yourself. Yes, I thought yeah, that's better. <laughs> Um, I don't know whether I'm sat here at the moment absolutely furiously angry or I just want to cry. And oh. the near run thing, um, I mean, um, I think um, one of the other councillors said, but we've not heard anything about this as far as Calderdale is concerned. Well, I haven't. And... Um, as a ward councillor, we are normally told of any strange or different things that happen in the town centre. I would I would put money on it that if these four people of the same week wore suits, we'd have known about it. Everybody would have known about it. But no, we don't. And you know, just some of the things that I said. I don't know how something signed off. Julia, if we can change it afterwards. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, it's the things about um, Union Street. Oh, we all know what Union Street's like. You know, um, we should be doing something if we do. And we've tried in the past and it hasn't worked. But we shouldn't give up. You know, and some of these people who, you know, and really at the end of everything they can try. When it's bad publicity for them, like when they're begging or when they um, or well, you know, getting up to up close to people and threatening or perceived to be threatening, we we'll hear about that. So, you know, um, we should have heard about it. And now whatever has to be done, it has to be done and not thinking about, well, such and such, you know, because we've all let these men down from the council because we didn't know, from the health authority, but from the hospitals, just everybody. 
And so I don't think I'm going to say anything else because I think I might be on the verge of getting myself into trouble. So perhaps it's something to pick up from that. Uh, thank you, Councillor as, as Swift, in relation to notification of ward, ward members when things like this happen in, the, in, well, we hope they don't happen in the future, but inevitably, yeah, um, whenever something happens, we we need to be part of the community. Can I bring Neil Taylor in, actually, just at this point, before I bring any other members in, just to see whether Neil has anything extra to, to add uh, um, before we move on to, to the questions. Neil, well, welcome, Neil. Neil. Uh, welcome, Chair, um, and thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to commend the work that's gone on, really, to, to, to get this report together. We obviously all feel that it's been absolutely necessary, which, which it is, to, which it absolutely is. So I have been part of the group, a uh, very a small part in the police side of it, to, to, um, to see exactly where we fit in with this and the training that we will take forward in partnership with, um, uh, with, with our partners to try and make sure that we do recognise the people on the on the streets, and we do uh, do more uh, ourselves, really, to recognise that vulnerability and make sure that uh, we signpost into service and uh, with our partners, etc. So, um, I, th I think it's a fantastic piece of work, and I, and I, and I think um, maybe part of the learning is that everybody should know about it. Maybe I don't know from what that councillor Swift obviously mentioned. Um, obviously, it's been brought to this this meeting, which is fantastic, and uh, all we can do is learn. It's a learning culture, not a blame culture, like um, uh, Julia alluded to, really. Um, we're going to move forward and do a better job and make sure these people are supported. The vulnerabilities are addressed and we do the absolute best we can to make sure this doesn't happen again. I think that's it from me. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you, Neil, for, for, for that. Right, I'll, I'll take them in order that I've seen them, so my apologies if they're in the wrong order. So, Councillor Rivon. No, just before Helen starts, Howard. Yes, oh, please, yeah. All the light, all the people were going on and off and on and off. And I wondered if it was just me, but um, it's stopped now. Thank you. Right, good. Right, Mar Marlis. Right, okay, thanks for that. So, Councillor, move on. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, I want to begin by saying what an excellent report I think this is. It's been a really moving report um, and a very powerful one. And I think re really want to thank you for that. Uh, I will also say, and I think about three or four years ago now, I came to speak to this panel about street. Uh, based lifestyles and I will say we seem to have come an awful long way and, and that's the positive I think out of what is actually a very depressing and a, and a very upsetting story. Before lockdown I regularly walk through town from the station to the bus station in the evening. I regularly pass people street begging. I know there's, ish, there's, there's not, there isn't a complete correlation between uh, homelessness street begging, street based lifestyles, but I think they are linked. And I'll, see, I'll have seen some of these people. I will have probably given them some money. I might have bought them a coffee. I might have tried to help them once or twice. I might have rung one of the services, tried to get them some help. So I'm one of the people who's failed them as well. Uh, and I feel that very powerfully. Um, thinking about the response that I always got, and I think, again, I see how people feel at the end of the line um, that I often got that people weren't engaging with service. People had tried to help them and nothing had worked. And I think one of the things you said was nobody could have solved, prevented these deaths on their own. Um, so it is very much about how people work together. But it is a sad indictment and we must learn from this. People dying in the early four, 30s and 40s on our streets is a very sad indictment. Uh, and I'm no way saying that it would have been, I'm sure they had all, obviously had multiple challenges and it would not have been easy for any service to have prevented these, but we must do better and we must try. Yes, and we know how difficult it is. Uh, I would welcome the thing you said about, I think around co-creating and, you know, working jointly to develop services because things done to, people don't work you know we've got to look at ways can we work together uh and and, and, to, and and to build better better services and i'm also very struck and again this does actually go from my own experience of this thing around uh, the dual diagnosis mental health issues and substance misuse and certainly this comes from you know people i know well who i've tried to support you have to either be mentally ill or have a substance issue you can't be both whereas i am sure it is very very common that those things go to go, go together but it really was like sort of sober up or stop 
using, and then we'll look at your mental health issues. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to work out that that just does not work. Um, it's a very, very powerful, I said, I found it very moving uh, setting report, but I do feel that we have got forward in it, read like a very open, honest attempt to actually look at the situation it is, and that's got to be the first step to doing this better and to and, and to building a, be a, a, a better service. So that has got to be the positive we take out of this, that you know we are at least recognising as it is, accepting the difficulties and starting to look at how we move forward. So again, thank you very much for what was a very powerful and very moving report. And I hope the next thing is, how can we do better uh, and not let this happen again? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Ruth. On, I've got uh, Councillor Hutchinson next. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, I, I was, it's strange to say, pleased to see the presentation that was given at this meeting because the report that was circulated with the papers uh, for the, for the, for, with the agenda really didn't do justice to the, to the subject. It, seemed, it completely omitted any of the personal stories of, the men, of these men who died and so it lacked any kind of uh, punch, any kind of uh, direction to it. I mean, I take on board what was saying that there's no collation of the records of the of people who've died who've been living street life, street life, uh, um, street based lives. So I do wonder what's happened. You know, this this happened three winters ago. And I wonder whether we know what happened in winter 2019-20 and winter tw the winter that's just passed, whether there are any additional people that can be added to um, the, this, this toll. Um, I am concerned that there's no, we've got a, the report that we were given suggested a lot of of potential actions, although a lot of it was couched in terms of uh, consider, explore, review, without any kind of timescales um, within it or any sign of priorities. And so, you know, I would hope that that will come out in the action plan, um, but they, they, I couldn't find any in the papers that we were given. Um, I mean, it strikes me from what we've heard that the problem is that these people that these people don't fit in with services. That we're told in so much of the other health services that we need to design services around the patient, but here we're expecting people to fit in to the services, and if they don't fit in, well, they don't count. And I would like to know how close. Uh, look is being made into the referral criteria into various services because too often those are used to say well they, they don't fit in with the, the referral criteria so we're not they're not for our service and I fully take on board what uh, Neve, Neve was saying about the, the tent trend to signposting rather than referral because then the res responsibility is all with the, pa with the patient or with the client, not with the person who's directing them. They wash their, ha wash their hands of it. Um, so I did wonder where we can draw good practice, evidence of good practice from, because that's referred to in the report, but no examples are given. And I mean, I am pleased to hear Neil Neil Taylor explaining the input from the police because in this paper there's no, nothing to suggest anything from uh, responsibility from the Justice Department, whether that's the police, probation, or the pri or the prison service. And I do believe that a lot of uh, people who uh, end up in home uh, in street-based lives do have prison records or, or records of uh, conviction, convictions. So I would like to see a clear sign of where probation, prison and police fit into this. 
In, thank you, thank you, Councillor uh, Hutchinson. I think I'm going to bring Julia in uh, and Eve into it in, oh. in a moment because I, I think part of this is is this was uh, requested an interim report to come to the to the meeting because uh, on the back of actually the the actual full report wasn't yet available. But you know, clearly we wanted it to to bring to members' attention as, as soon as possible. Really, so so Julia, I'll bring Julia uh, and then Eve uh, into answer some of your points, Councillor Hutchinson. Yeah, and then I can answer Sorry, them first. <laughs> I'll hand over to me then, yeah, I'll, um, I will can just go through. So the sign-off process, Megan, um, it's not signed off yet. If you can remember the board meeting where there's 30 people sat around that board, we don't yeah. want any questions at that point of what's this, what's that. So the sign-off process has to be an internal, the individual organisations would be happy to sign that off. So at that point, we've gone to independent scrutiny. Our agency statutory and voluntary community are happy for that report to have independent scrutiny that independent scrutiny will come back if there are groundbreaking things that that say then that will actually have to go back out to the agencies to be consulted on again um, if they're really drastic things if it's minimal then that will be um go to the board for the final sign off so it hasn't been signed off yet Me megan um it will be signed off at the safeguarding adult board once all of those things have been done and um, the second point about the notification of um the, for, for yourselves um so there is a process in place that before a report is going to be published and this can be a, a serious case for you SAR, domestic homicide review etc we work with lucy bradwell within the local authority actually but the, the comms team there to make sure that you're all aware of that if you would like to have we don't have a direct communication at any other point so when we get referrals in about deaths or abuse or neglects when we start to undertake a review we don't have a notification process for you if you want us to do that and start doing that then that may be something we can talk about but at the moment we don't at, we we inform all board members who sit around that board obviously um but, but it's not there so we, we can maybe discuss that yeah neve um, and and councillor hutchins with the, the personal stories in the report we were we were just providing an, an interim report councillor hutchins and it, it, the report itself is 80 odd pages long and and does go into what what you've described the action plan itself is uh, very much measured dates who's responsible by when how are we going to know that it's had any impact what's the evidence that it has and you know it's very in-depth is the action plan itself um and yeah sorry neve I was just going to say, um, Councillor Hutchinson, from my account, and Neil will know better, I would say there's been another four, in the since then deaths, there's probably been another four very similar, certainly from that cohort. And again, we still haven't got the notification. But as, as Julia says, in those 30,000 words, there's a lot. And there's, there's, uh, it's much more in depth. And a lot of the issues that you described there are pulled apart a little bit. What I would say, what was interesting, to me and others, there was very little police involvement, which is really interesting um, in the cases. And I think it leaves us with somewhere to look at how we could improve that from a welfare point of view. But what was quite interesting, they were, they, I would say they would be perceived as pests, low level offenders. The police recording of them was really just setting eyes upon them other than that. Um, but, but there was a lot more in terms of probation input or lack of. Excellent. Thank you, Neve. Uh, do we have any indication of dates when the reports are actually going to be published? If the feedback from the independent scrutiny says that's brilliant, well done, great job, no changes, it'll go directly to the board where it will be signed off. If they say anything else, then it might. It depends what they say as to um, uh, as to uh, Neve's hanging ahead here, but uh, whether there's any further work required to be undertaken. Uh, we want to get this right. We don't just want to write a report and publish it. We want to have the learning for Calderdale to actually affect things in the best possible way we can. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that. Well, I think I've got Councillor Evans next. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, we, we're in danger of beginning to overlap with each other as we go through questions, but obviously a dreadful and upsetting story. Uh, and I'm pleased to note that right from the beginning, we're talking in terms of uh, learning points here rather than pointing fingers and so on. Um, one of my concerns though is that it's taken two years so far 
to get to this point. I know we've had COVID and things like that. One of my concerns is that is, is the time scale that we're, we're talking about. And I understand the need for it to be right and signed off and all those sorts of things. But I do have an underlying concern about the timing on this. Uh, I also have concerns about the fact that I think Megan started off by saying that uh, we've just not we've not been aware of this until this report arrives. So a little bit concerned about that issue as well. Some standout points for me in relation to this is that um, there is a reference to the fact that <clears throat> agencies reported decline in appearance of some of these men, but there weren't any onward referrals resulting from that, and that's been highlighted, but it's certainly another concern area for me. Um, and this tendency to rely on signposting rather than referral, uh, which um, uh, Councillor Hutch Hutchinson has highlighted as well. Um, I believe that Collardale has a multi-agency self-neglect policy and toolkit which links up with some of the things we're saying about the need for joint action on these things and people getting involved uh, jointly and working with each other on issues. Um, and, but the report seems to suggest that frontline workers weren't aware of this particular report, this uh, particular policy, sorry. So I think there's perhaps a, a need to review that situation and see whether people are aware of that. Um, a more general point which has occurred to me is that I believe that central government recognises the need for cross-government approach to deal with this sort of issue. Uh, and therefore what that for me does, it emphasises the importance of replicating a similar approach within local authorities. And it brings us to this point of pulling all things together, which is we're already beginning to talk about, which is great. Um, the... Can I, it, sorry. can I just come back to Councillor yeah, Simons? Well, I was thinking, just I mean, for everybody really, just thinking about what happened between May and November and, and there's some concern about the time scale. What happened is we had to look very, very quickly at how we supported this <laughs> client group through COVID. That involved bringing them in, keeping them in, keeping them out of hospital, keeping them off the streets, dealing with their addiction, getting access to healthcare, and actually an incredible thing happened. You know, we, we, without being able to evict people, everybody had to work very differently with this client group. Mm. Um, and, and, and it's been amazing. There's been a, there'll be a report on that because there's been a heap load of learning out of it and new ways of working. But the upshot of that is on May the 3rd this year, we will be opening a high quality eight bedded unit for this client group in Halifax. Yes. Yeah. So there's all this has been happening. It's almost like as a You're result of a point. Point. I was going to... So I haven't <laughs> been at home. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure you have sure. you know, there's, you know, there's, there's been, a, so we've managed an awful lot and, and, and thinking about the pathways into adult health and social care. We've had safeguarding, and I've been in Calderdale 12 years, never had a safeguarding planning meeting for an adult from this group. Um, without their consent because we were so concerned of their safety. So there's been a huge cultural shift going on behind the scenes. So hopefully by the time the report is published, we'll have at least 30% job done for a lot of it. That's good to hear. Uh, and because one of my concerns is that because it's in separate bits, there tends to be a higher total system cost associated with that. Uh, and uh, yeah. you know there are opportunities for whole system efficiencies if we can work together like this. So we, we all know that one of the problems with uh, funding the sort of work that we're going to be talking about is funding, uh, but obviously the, the whole system approach is going to help that and yeah. spread the money more effectively and, and get better results. Uh, yeah. and one of the things that I was just doing a bit of research on, on this, uh, and I believe there's some work being done in Australia. I know Australia is a long way from here, but the Victoria state has, seems to have come up with some very good practice ideas. I don't know whether members or, or, or officers have picked that one up, uh, but yeah. they have set up a, a process called multiple and complex needs initiative which looks at pulling everything together in, in these ways and they have come up with some good ongoing evidence of the positive impact that that has had and I feel that might be just be something worth looking at so I think the essential thing is is for is all the learning points uh, and the joint working and this is the beginning process of, well, not the beginning from our point of view because we're involved in this meeting this is the beginning process of, of that happening because 
obviously we don't want it to happen in the future. So, uh, but thank you for the work. Thank you for the responses you're giving. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing the final results. Yeah, okay. thank, thank you, Councillor Evans. Uh, um, Councillor Barnes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, wow, have we let these people down? Have we let these five people down? And um, uh, I'm afraid um, it was disappointing to hear that um, Neve say um, potentially four others, but no notifications received. Two over two years, over two years since this first occurred, and yet still no notifications have been received. I'm going to use four Ds: depressing, disappointed, or disappointing, and I apologise if my tenses are wrong. Um, distressing, damning, and I'm very difficult to be diplomatic in my choice of language at this moment in time. And it is very, very, and I don't mean to say to criticise any, and, and, and yeah, we, we are here at Scrutiny to be a, a, a critical friend, but friends must accept mistakes and friends must, must accept errors and must, must take it on the chin at times. And I'm afraid this is one that we have to. This is one that two years later we are, I, I get no impression that we're any further forward. You know, that, that you know, no notifications. Neve, I'm sorry, those, those are your words. Four further deaths with no notifications. The CCG can't be bothered to turn up. And yet the CCG are a vital component in this. Can't be bothered to turn up in what is an important and very depressing report. And I'm so glad that you mentioned those five, the, the five names in, 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 in your slides to, 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 to humanize it, because that's what this is about. It is to humanize this whole situation, not processes, not procedures. It's about human beings, human beings who we let down and who die. And, and I think I'm going to stop at that. So thank you for the opportunity to talk, Chair, and thank you very much for the report. No, th thank you, Councillor Barnes. And you do raise something that I was going to, to pick up, actually, which was the uh, uh, the lack of attendance with the CCG uh, th this evening, which is, is disappointing because we, we always, we are a critical friend with it all, all must uh, help as well at the same time. And I think it, it comes down to one of the at the end is, is to... Um, uh, use our formal powers to to request that they do attend uh, the uh, as our future meeting. So that's what, one of the things I'll pro uh, propose forward. So thank you, Councillor Barnes, for the, uh, for, for the motive that they, uh, um, yeah, rightful language uh, used there. I've got Councillor Clark. I've also got Councillor Stephen Lee afterwards as well. So, Councillor Clark. I'm speaking. Thank you, Chair. Um, you talk about the, you know, a four um, currently, and you've not had any notification. How do you know that there are four? Neve, do you want to uh, answer that? You know, I was just unmuting. Um, I know that there are that four men who fit this cohort have died over the last 18 months because I've been told by different people. Well, why can you not, not about... take it up yourselves? Why, why do you need it, a notification? We need, well, we need a process and somewhere for this to go that's systematic so that we can look and see if there are safeguarding issues or there's something that we want to look at. It's rather than just somebody saying to me, Neil saying to me, oh, did you hear so-and-so died, for example. That's how, at the moment, that's how what, it's working. What tends to happen, so what, 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 these reviews are very costly um, in terms of people's time, so that's two years, um, they're very, very costly. Once we've got the learning from a review, so I don't know, some of you are involved in our Child M serious case review about child sexual exploitation and the learning that that generated, it completely changed our system to be an absolutely fantastic good process. 
other children who have suffered from child sexual exploitation, we don't necessarily need to do another review about those children to give us the same learning. So we just need to be careful that if, if, if there is going to be some new learning, then we need to undertake a review. But if there's not, then we don't. What we need to establish in this case is actually, are we going to be noted? There's a lot of... We review every single child death. There's a lot of adults that die. We need to put some parameters around this to see if there is actually going to be any new learning um, to, to, to undertake a review. This piece of work that, that Neve has done, that, that we've done as a safeguarding adult board, will propel us and have done in, in terms of multi-agency working and our focus and, if, and people learn about trauma-informed practice, basically. Um, you know, it, if there is going to be new learning, fine, but we wouldn't necessarily, just to, just to make you all aware, we wouldn't necessarily be doing a review about, about every day. Coach Scott, did you want to come back? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. I'm not talking about doing a review, but are you, are you aware of these people? Were you aware of them before they died? Were you aware, aware of the five that died before the death? Were, were they being safeguarded at that point? No, they weren't. I, I was aware of them through my connections with the drug and alcohol treatment and through working in Halifax. There wasn't, um, there was no um, other official awareness of them, was there? As I know, Julia, no. Yeah, no, no, no. I think, no. I think, that, I think the whole thing that I've, I've heard in quite a lot of different council meetings is the lack of communications between different agencies. And I think yeah. that's the root of almost all yes. delays and things that aren't happening. Okay, okay can I bring Councillor Lee in at this stage, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I agree with many of the comments that uh, fellow board members have already made. Um, I have to say, I'm very disappointed sitting here right now. I realise that the report isn't finalised. First of all, as a general comment, right at the very beginning, I must agree with Megan Swift's comment about what was said about Union Street. Now, th this is symptomatic of an attitude of mind. It's a concept. But if some, if it, it must surely be unacceptable to anyone here this evening that if something is known about a place in Halifax, to talk about it as a known problem area and accept it is totally unacceptable. If there's something going on, we need to get it dealt with, not talk about it three years after the events, and who knows what's happened, you know, since then, apart from the four deaths. And as has been said, it's some time since these incidents occurred. And I've not heard anything that satisfies my demands for action plans, positive plans, means of monitoring the plans to achieve results. I've just not heard it, and I know that Councillor Barnes alluded to it. So instead of talking in the abstract, here's my question, Chair. I asked if someone tonight is asleep on the, on the street in Halifax, what ought to happen tonight to potentially save a life? And I've heard nothing that could do that in the report this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Uh, Neve, would, would you want to respond to that? Yeah. So tonight, you could ring, um, there's a widely advertised number, but if not, if they're in the centre of Halifax, we have street outreach workers, and we have beds at the Gathering Place Shelter um, in town, and that would be the first point of contact tonight. And in that shelter, you'll have drug and alcohol workers, um, access to district nursing, you can register with the GP and we'll try to move you on into more stable accommodation, ideally not in Union Street, as soon as we can. Okay, do, does somebody want to um, uh, answer the question in relation to the uh, place where we know that there is an issue like Union Street and who, who's, who's responsible for, for, for that, basically? You know, if you're, if you're aware as an agency, um, you know, who, who do you then report to? Neve, do you want to come back on that? I think 
issues like Union Street, when you're talking about place, require a multi-agency response and a slow response. And I think most of us in the last 12 months have just been, you know, working, doing what we can to keep our heads above water, keep everything ticking over, and I take on our additional COVID responsibilities. I think it is, would be interesting to look at a place like that, but that would require police, housing, public health. It would require an approach. I mean, there are different ways you could do it. But something you could do is look at Union Street and the people that live there and ask them how they thought we could improve it. I mean, there's lots of ways of looking at it. And I think it would be a really interesting piece of work, Councillor Lee. It's capacity, I think, that probably prevents it rather than will. Is it specifically mentioned in the report in terms of highlighting the, the, the areas in the actual I don't report? Think I, I don't think I mentioned the name, but I, we talk no, about... No, you mentioned areas. ...hot spots and what can happen. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Let me bring Helen Hunter in from Health Watch. Uh, welcome uh, once again, Helen. You're always welcome to these meetings, and you're also uh, so so well pleased. Yeah. Um, I've got a few different things that I wanted to say. Uh, so just so you can understand where I come from in this context. So Health Watch ha it sits on the Safeguarding Adults Board. Um, I'm the representative that sits on the Safeguarding Adults Board and I chair the Communication and Engagement Subgroup of the Safeguarding Adults Board and Safeguarding Children's Partnership. Um, so um, as a member of that board, I feel like across this whole period of time, we have been kept aware in terms of how this work is progressing. And there's been a lot of questioning in that board about how and when the report will be produced. So there has been kind of consistent challenge within the within that board about the pace at which this is happening. And I think it's important that you have that assurance that actually that certainly has been something that's been championed across the board. I think what I would say through having been part of listening to that challenge is that I am very much assured that over the last two years, whilst this piece of work has been ongoing, we haven't just been observing the problem and trying to articulate it. This is something that has sparked action and sparked change. And I think that we're starting from a place where the kind of people who have been whose lives have been examined in in this report haven't had the right support for decades this isn't something that we were working on already that we that we'd kind of not quite got right this is something where people have been chronically under supported for a, a huge period of time so actually the changes that have been made um, are, are I think we would all agree our steps toward where we want to be, not a, not a final article. I think that this is something that's catalyzed action and it's something that should never have happened and it shouldn't have been necessary for this to happen, for that action to be catalyzed. But I think it's it, the, the piece of work, the report, you know, um, I think from my perspective, listening to somebody like Neve talk with the compassion and understanding of what the lives of those people are like is incredibly compelling um, and helps us to understand that there has historically been a perception of some of these people that is not accurate, that does not articulate the truth of their lives and the difficulties that they have experienced. Um, and I think that's a really fundamental and really important part of, of, of this piece of work and what we're doing. Um, in terms of, um, of a health watch perspective, I would absolutely endorse a lot of what was said in the presentation about people struggling to navigate the system, struggling to get the so the kind of if if you if you are empowered, if you feel like you can speak out, if you feel like you can do things for yourself, a signpost might work quite well for you. Actually, there's lots of occasions when people don't still don't necessarily um, get the good outcome from the signpost, but certainly in these people's cases. I think the importance of somebody navigating them through the system and being a consistent source of support, something that is sustainable, is really, really critical um, and some consistency in how that's delivered. Um, I am um, really mindful that for this group, it's really important to have person-centred, flexible support. Um, and I think that it's really important to have trusted people who are supporting somebody. So you might be the person that's working in housing support and this person might have massive problems with debts and drug and alcohol. But if you're the person they trust, then you're the person that has to guide them into the different bits of the, of the services. Um, and I think there was something really pertinent in what uh, Neve said about the... Um, 
the fact that, that during the COVID-19 period, there hasn't been scope for us to evict people from their homes and how that's a different way of working. And actually, I think that the insight that would come out of that as a complementary part to this report will tell us how far we could have been coming for a period of time if we had perhaps looked at these people situations through a slightly different lens. So I think that this piece of work is an opportunity for us to start a fundamentally different conversation. And I think it's great that there's so much challenge because actually we need Need that because these people haven't had what they should have had for a really really long time and um, and so I, I just think we need to think of this as as our kick up the bum that means that we all have to get going and we all have to be focused on this because it's not acceptable for us to know it might happen and think that we can kind of just ignore it yeah, thank, thank you Helen um, I'm going to bring Marianne uh, in at this stage um, hopefully Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I understand what uh, the frustration from uh, some of our councillors around what they perceive is a slow pace of change in really difficult circumstances. But I think if you do look at closely at some of the document that came out to you, it does actually talk in there about tangible things that have changed uh, whilst this report has been uh, completed, about how these people who are largely not seen by services are being sought out, uh, are being, uh, tabs are being kept on them um, and support is being taken to them rather than expecting them to seek um, that, that support. And certainly, um, you know, you've got my pledge as chair of the board that this is something that's right at the top of my of my agenda and the board's agenda to make the partners work effectively together with the really difficult um too difficult to do box of people and not just these people but people that perhaps live a, live alone that don't access services um but just to go back to the issue about who do we know if they've, if they've died um every child in this country is deemed by law to be vulnerable so every child that dies in this country up until the age of 18, we have systems and processes that all of those deaths are notified and all of those deaths are looked at on a multi-agency basis to identify whether we need to do a detailed review. That process is just not in place for adults in any way, shape or form. There is not one agency in the country that knows every adult that's died. You know, the coroner will know if there are some suspicious circumstances. A GP will authorise a death certificate and some people will die in hospital. Um, so there isn't anybody that knows who's died. Um, I can't imagine that the government is gonna set something up like we have done for children across the country, given the situation that we're in. What we can do locally is look to ensure that on top of the existing provisions that we have, that when we know when we have sight of a person, when we know that they are vulnerable, that they are in receipt of services, we can alert and say, actually, we think we could have done more on this occasion. And that's how these safeguarding adults reviews um, start. So I think there's more that we can do to make sure that these, some of these people that have been hidden are seen by services and that we have some additional checks and balances that we can put in place to make sure that perhaps this particular cohort, we have that notification and we do look to see if there is more that we can do and whether we need to do those reviews. But, but, but nobody um, has, knows everything. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you, Marianne. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's very, very uh, good word. Neil, can I bring you in then? I'll bring Councillor Metcalf in. You know, it's just it's just something I want to uh, again commend Neve and the team for. Um, we have to remember. I know we're not talking about COVID today. We're talking about street-based lives. But at the end of the day, the amount of work that went on to gather people up on the streets to get them into the gathering and safe and safely into accommodation, and by doing that into services to help them and support them has been absolutely amazing. If I'm honest, and uh, I just want to commend again the work that Neve and the team have done to to, to achieve that. And that has, that has been a good start of a turn for me to get people off the streets, into accommodation, into services. And by doing that, I've no doubt we'll probably save some lives there, to be fair. Uh, so I just want to make that point. Thank you very much, Chair. No, thank you, Neil. Uh, Councillor Metcalf. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, can I apologise? It would have to be this meeting, which I wanted to listen uh, to very carefully, where I had a lot of connection problems at the start. So I did miss, unfortunately, uh, most of the slides that, uh, uh, that were given. I, I did pick up, though, on the, uh, on the, the last one or two. And I think that the, the important one to me at the end was um, the um, what, what, what was the, the reporting and assurance to the CAB, um, the Safeguarding Board. I think it was on the last line of the last slide, and that is an important match. Obviously, as, as we've heard earlier, this report's the final report to, to come back for approval by, by SAB. Um, and I think it really is important that we get to, working through those steps that uh, those comprehensive steps that was on the last slide um it is important we get a full report back on the work on that at sab and and then obviously consider just where where the situation is the um the important thing is uh, is 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 that uh, as i as a sab board member do want to be really assured that uh, everything possible has been done and this report i think everybody said is is a really really comprehensive report. It has taken a, a long time, appreciate that, and these, these reports do, um, unfortunately, but to get them right, it's to get, do we need to put the right time in and get the right results at the end of it all. Just, just one or two other comments, very briefly. Um, I think an interesting and important question was raised amongst all the important questions uh, board members have mentioned tonight, and that is communication. I think that there is there is, and it just isn't over this, over this sad, sad story. Uh, uh, it, it is a general thing. We just need to, and we all need to improve communication in whatever form it takes at times to make sure everybody is, is, is involved, that needs to be involved at the right time. I know it's difficult, is that, but it is, a, it is a really important point. Communication both within the council and within the key partners and, and, and our key agencies is a really important thing. Just after mention as a town walk councillor, Union Street, because it's cropped up a couple of times tonight already. Um, I, I wish, uh, I mean, Councillor Lee did mention it and said get it sorted or whatever words he used. Um, I wish it was that simple. It's a real difficult problem is the Union, and it's not just Union Street, it's the Union Street area in Halifax. It is a very difficult area because of the uh, not because of the private landlords, because there are a lot of private landlords there. So there's, so there's a rapid turnover yeah. of, of tenancies yeah. at Union Street. There's been a lot of input over the years. Walk yeah. Council has raised this area repeatedly many, many times. Uh, there's been a lot of input from, from the council and from the police. But it is a difficult nut to crack. And you know, you know, I have to say it's a difficult nut to crack is that area. Uh, we, we try our best to work with those landlords to be responsibly let those properties to people and to make sure that they make sure that uh, uh, they, they are being you know, that their tenants are looking after not not causing issues uh, and problems there. It is a it is a difficult area and we're working on it, but it's not and it's not going to be resolved overnight. I would say that it would be nice if we had more resources both from the police and for other agencies and ourselves to be able to put into areas like this to, to enable more work to be done with, with the residents of those areas. But there has been door-to-door -door, uh, activity over the years. There's been a number of different initiatives there, um, uh, but it still is a difficult one. It, uh, uh, so Councillor Lee, we are, work, we, do, we are aware of it. We are working on it. It comes repeatedly up to, uh, repeatedly up to uh, the Halifax Town Centre Safer for Greener uh, uh, Committee. Uh, in fact, it, I think it was mentioned again today there. So we have a regular input and, and get the agencies informed on any problems. I must have raised as walk council over the years dozens of issues regarding that particular area, as, I, as have our other walk councillors in town walk. So I just want to mention that it is difficult, um, but, uh, but we're Thank aware of it. So could yeah, I just, just on a point of order, please. Uh, I didn't say in a disparaging manner, get it sorted. And that was quite unkind to say that I did. I said it was unacceptable that uh, it can be said of a place in Halifax that everybody knows about it. Simple as that. Described by Councillor Metcalf. Thank you. 
Uh, well, I, 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 won't, I, won't, I won't go back on that. I think I've said enough, but I think Councillor Lee knows what I'm meaning. And, and, and we are working. Okay, cool. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to just stop, stop on, on that issue. I just want to say, uh, I think the report is, is, is re really well drafted and, and well being well presented. And there's obviously uh, some very, very challenging questions tonight, rightly asked about it. So it'll be coming back to the Safe Guardian Board yeah. in due course and we'll take it from there. And um, we'll receive the full report as well, uh, uh, Councillor Metcalf. So we, we'll have the opportunity to, to look at the full report with all the uh, recommendations, hopefully at some stage in the near future. I've got about four, five, four people to come in. So I'm going to bring Sean Cook in at this stage. And I've got, um, I've got Councillor Barnes, Councillor Hutchinson and Councillor Clark. And if I've missed anyone, my, my apologies. So Sean, if you'd like to, to come in at this stage. Thank you, Councillor Barbara. It was just to reassure the board that um, in terms of um, work within adult social care, but with all the other agencies, um, such as the CCG um, and health colleagues, the acute trust and so on, um, the, the work that was um, cited uh, by Neve as far as MIAM is concerned, um, making every adult matter, plus other initiatives around that in terms of involving people in the process that, that was cited in the presentation, um, a lot of work is underway and we do have genuinely a way to go, but there's a recognition now that um, we need um, a very simple, um, easy, accessible system that people can be referred to. And importantly, um, there's accountability across the agencies as has been cited uh, across the, the whole discussion this evening. So um, work is underway to make that happen in terms of the restructuring from a, a, an operational point of view with Gateway to Care so that we can ensure that um, people aren't falling through the system as they have in the past and that we can be there in a more timely way than we have been before. Uh, so it was just to give that reassurance that, that plenty of activity is already on the way. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Sean. Right, I'll bring in um, uh, Councillor Barnes first. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I think from my early comments, and whilst I appreciate how distressing it is for us, I appreciate that Julia and Neve, the amount of work they've done and how, how, how distressing it must have been for them doing this report. So, so, so thank you for that. Um, I would like to make a recommendation, Chair, isn't that, and I think part of the issue tonight is um, a lack of engagement with, with us as a scrutiny committee. And I think uh, a recommendation would be in future that if any such reviews take place, that engagement with scrutiny occurs at a much earlier stage than this. In fact, we should be involved throughout the process, not at the end of the process. So I'd like to make that recommendation going forward, please, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I'm more than happy to, to second that. So if we can take that at the end, so just come back and say you propose what you've said, and then, then we'll, 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 we'll go with that. I think that's really, it's a really important issue. Right, I think I've got uh, Councillor Clark. Oh, Julia, sorry, would you like to come in? There might be some more questions about that because the Safeguarding Adult Board is the independent scrutiny board that looks at the process. So it just needs to be able to, in, otherwise I'll be reporting to two <laughs> governing bodies, if you see what I'm saying, and two scrutineers. Um, so it, may, it just might need a little bit more thinking about at, at what points, um, but and certainly we can get that communication in, but it's just about that, the, where's the scrutiny coming from? Because I'll have two or more taskmasters, perhaps. We'll, 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 co we'll coordinate that, but I think it's, it's still a really relevant point that we, we are made aware at much earlier, uh, earlier stage. I think it's quite uh, quite key. So I'm going to bring in Councillor Clark next. Yep, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say, I mean, this this review has been brought about by the the, the result of um, the deaths of of the men um, who who they had no no they had no awareness of um, at the beginning of the <laughs> review. Now. Since then, also the result of this review is that there are many, many positive <coughs> hopefully, in, in the future. The future changes are going to be much more collaborative, hopefully, um, and people will be made very much more aware all along the line. Um, I, I just think, I wonder how many lives they have saved since the start of this review. We can't prove negatives, that's the thing, isn't it? So um, it, it's, 
yes, we can blame whoever we like for these four deaths, five deaths, um, but we can't prove the lives that have been saved. It's always something we'll never know. Thank, thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, I'll bring in Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know that the topic for the on the agenda has was this review into the deaths, but as Neve has already pointed out, and as I've heard in a number of other forums regarding the COVID response, there has been a huge amount of work done on the back of some of it stimulated by the COVID response. So I do take on board that things haven't stood entirely still while the review has been going on. And I would like, you know, given that it sounds as if this is likely to come back to this board in the fairly near future, personally, I would like to hear a lot more about what has been taking place in the, gath uh, the gathering place and in the planning for the unit that's being set, that's being opened shortly. Um, and so sort of there's also mention about um, possible involvement of uh, house, the housing services in prisoners' early release, so that they can, so that you can try and avoid some of the housing problems or short circuit them. So I think there's a lot, probably, you know, I'm assuming that has gone on concurrent with the product with the drafting of this report. And I think it's just a shame that that's kind of been separated from uh, from consideration of the report by itself. So if, if it does return to the board soon, I would like it to take that into account as well. That's a really uh, useful um, uh, uh, suggestion, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. That's something that I think is uh, we we'll, we'll, we'll very much welcome. Uh, uh, you know, what, what's happened since and, and COVID, of course. Right, I'm, I've got Ian Bain. So, Ian, would you like to come in at this stage, please? Um, thank you. And I, 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 I want to kind of start off by saying that I understand quite rightly why people are so angry. I think all the officers that have been trying to work through this area are as equally as angry. The important thing that I think we need to recognise is how do we operate differently to ensure that these things don't happen again. I started my social work career in London in a um, homelessness project, uh, quite a famous homelessness project. And some of the things that I faced as a, as a newly qualified social worker, these are the cases that the four cases, five cases we heard about today were the very things that were happening in the mid 80s. So we do need national policy to change. We do need a different approach. But I think one of the things that I think is really important, I think one of the learnings I'm taking from Gathering Place is the key difference Gathering Place made is we put the services to the people. We didn't ask people to navigate a system that's really difficult for most people to navigate. Actually, what we need is people who will, you know, I'm, I've heard people historically talk about people who are, who are just hard to engage or they are, um, or they will simply not be compliant with what we want. Ask a homeless person who's lived on the street for a number of days to turn up for an appointment at a, at a point in time. Um, the likelihood is they're not going to make it at that time on that day. But actually, if you can wrap those services around and take those services to people, then they are more than willing to engage. And I think if there's nothing that we take from today, it's about how do we make sure we can bring those systems and those services to people rather than expecting people to navigate them when the majority of us would struggle along that way. So, I, you know, I, I tend not to try to be angry in scrutiny uh, and I do try to play the officer that's going to be neutral. But actually, it does worry me that, that we can still think we ask people to fit into systems when actually one of the easiest ways to do this is to bring the system to people and I think gathering place is testament to that and if that's the heart of our model then I think we've we've made great progress. 
Th th thank you, Ian. So I'm going to propose, on the back of uh, uh, Councillor Barnes's uh, suggestion, that this, this panel wishes to work with the Safeguarding Board to ensure that there is a mechanism in place to ensure that we are notified at the first opportunity of any serious uh, cases. Do I get the? I've got the gist of that, Mike. Some, something on those lines. I, I think. I think. I think. Yeah. I think the word "engaged." I, I, I think "engaged with" is is a good one, and I appreciate Julia's comment that yeah, she doesn't want to be um, uh, beholden to two to two masters. Um, yeah. Which actually was a very good play if you ever get a chance to see it. But there we go. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there we go. But. But I think if engage with us at, an, at the earliest yeah, possible moment. Yeah, exactly. So I'll, I'll, uh, if I'll, I'll put that as a proposition. So if I, uh, Mike, can you second that? That's, as you would pretty much propose it, but yeah, uh, I'm pretty much in favour of it. <laughs> I've just reworded it, that, that's all. So it's, uh, uh, equal, I'd, you know, really do want to thank you for bringing the interim reports this evening. And I, I know... You know, it was. Uh, I'm pleased we, we we spoke over the phone with with uh, with Julius. I'm pleased we had that conversation so that actually we were able to bring it to this panel this evening so that members were aware and and raised some really serious and important uh, uh, points as well. So so Julia, uh, thank you for that. Neve, thank you equally for for presenting and answering some of the things. And Marianne, thank you for for being chair. It's it, it's 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 quite a, a daunting task to have to to do to to watch the deal with something on these lines. Uh, Helen, you, you're going to come back in. <laughs> Sorry, I was just wondering if I could make a suggestion because I'm really aware, having been to so, far, far too many of these scrutiny meetings, that scrutiny obviously did a big piece of work that kind of looked at learning from COVID and how COVID had impacted services and things like that. And I just wonder if there's something about tying together two different threads here where actually we've got a lot of learning from COVID about how we can work with some of our most vulnerable people, particularly people who live in street-based lives, and whether, you know, if there's ongoing work that the scrutiny panel is doing related to learning from COVID, whether actually these two things could, you know, there could be some uh, synergy between those two things and, and have yeah. something captured together. Perfect. Thank you, Helen. Mar Marianne, did you want to, I think you've got your hand raised, did you want to come back in? Yeah, it was just to say, you know, I really welcome uh, the views that have been expressed and I understand the frustrations, um, but, you know, the Safeguarding Adult Board is, is there for everybody in Calderdale, you know, and I'm the chair of that board and I'm your chair, uh, councillors. So, you know, if there is something where you feel there are vulnerable um, adults and there are some concerns in your wards, um, then, you know, feel free to contact me or Julia, somebody from the team and flag up those concerns so that we can seek assurance that those things are being tackled too. You know, it's important that we work together. Um, so, you know, please, um, you know, we are board too. Yeah, fantastic. Can I just ask you, Marianne, in relation to uh, the CCG's involvement, because we, you know, clearly we, we haven't got the representation to, uh, tonight and we'd like, um, we'd like to, to know, you know, really, well, we'd like to hear from them directly, which will be formally um, uh, requesting them to attend a scrutiny meeting. But I um, just wondered if you had any uh, interim uh, views on that at all. I'm surprised that they're not here, to be fair. Uh, I mean, certainly we, we get really good support from the CCG, uh, both at that strategic level, but also with the with the safeguarding um, named nurse for, for adults. Uh, Luke uh, is really, really supportive and very much has been very, very much uh, a key person involved in this review with Neve. So um, I'm surprised. I'm really surprised and disappointed like you that they're not here today. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. They know what sort of a chair I am, so I'm, I'm fairly fair, and so we, we don't let anyone go away upset or anything like that. That's um, Council Hutchinson. Do you want to come back in on on that? Um, yeah, I also wondered about uh, South West Yorkshire Partnership Foundation Trust as well, because certainly questions have been raised about dual diagnosis and whether there's the services that are available for that, and. Uh, you know, I, ju I just wondered, you know, we haven't had a chance to hear from them, their perspective on this. I don't want to re replicate what's gone on in the Safeguarding Adults Board, but I do think they're one of the key players. So whether they could be invited uh, or required or invited as well as the CCG. Okay, so if I have it on authority, can I, I take you on board that we can put something together with, um, with Mike? Uh, Mike's going to come back in and explain exactly what he's going to do. <laughs> uh, I just wanted, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Chair, I'm going to get all governance now. <laughs> 
So that if you um, you have powers under the local authority public health health and wellbeing boards and health, health scrutiny regulations 2013 to formally request that uh, a body come a health body comes to 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 discuss an issue with you. You have to do uh, three things. I think you have to invite them. You have to give them reasonable notice and a date when you'd like to talk to them. And you have to give them uh, an indication of what you want to talk to them about. Um, and I think you know what you want to talk to them about. So that would be about, if you like, their response to the, the report and the presentation you've heard this evening. But you, if you want to make it a formal request, then you have to formally resolve those things. Um, uh, and I would just say that if you do do that and decide, I mean, you could do that now or you could do it at the end of the meeting under the work plan. Uh, but if you invite them to the next meeting, you will have to do some work plan rescheduling. That's okay. It, uh, uh, Marianne, sorry, do you want to come back in on that one? What I was going to say is once the report is published with its uh, recommendations and an action plan, it will be really clear the engagement of the different health providers, you know, where they're featured in the report in terms of providing services or not, and in terms of any recommendations they need to take forward as a single agency. So, I mean, I understand that there's some time pressures. You know, I'm fairly optimistic that we will get good feedback from the external scrutiny. She says so clearly it won't happen now. Um, and we will be we'll be in a position to publish pretty quickly. Um, and I think probably seeing that report, seeing the action plan um, and where we are up to with the action plan will probably give you some assurance. And at that point, you could actually identify if there are particular agencies that you'd want to, to invite to that meeting. OK, well, we'll certainly we, we uh, very much welcome the, the full report as soon as, as it, it can possibly be published. I think we go on the lines of um, uh, possibly a, um, uh, an email from uh, myself, Mike, uh, uh, expressing our extreme disappointment that the CCG weren't in attendance tonight. A number of questions that um, councillors would have wished to, to have asked them uh, and request them to, uh, to come at the earliest um, uh, the earliest opportunity. I think we we've always had a good relationship with the CCG. I don't want to I don't want to ruin that in any possible way or make it uh, as though it's, they, they don't want to uh, ever come back here. Um, so so if members have that, if, if members are in agreements with something on those lines, yeah. Yeah, superb. So if we can do that, yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you once again for attending and uh, providing a very you know uh, a comprehensive re re response to some of the issues that have been raised. Uh, and we, we we do look forward to working with you and uh, and the safeguarding board, of, of course, in in the future. So thank you very much for your time on on this one. So so thank you. So we'll go on to item number six, which is the. COVID uh, briefing. Karen, welcome, Karen, and thank you for being uh, uh, very patient there. Would you like to uh, uh, continue with that item number? I'm presuming that you're leading the briefing for the public health uh, part. So, Karen, would you like to uh, present uh, the briefing on the public health part? We're having technical difficulties. I'm not quite sure. Yes, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm having problems with my internet. Um, so can you hear me at all? all right, we can hear you now. Yes, we can. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope, I hope Councillor uh, uh, Lee is still here because I know that he, he, he likes to, to hear this. Um, in terms of um, our uh, case rate, first of all, I'll give, give you the statistics and then a little bit about, well, where are we at? Um, our case rate um, for the seven days weekend in the 5th of March was 79.9, so essentially 80 um, per 100,000. That was a 33% decrease from the previous week. Um, in terms of our over 60 uh, rate, it's uh, 48 per 100,000, which again is lower than, than the previous week. Uh, um, we're currently bottom of the, the reverse league table, which is good uh, in West Yorkshire. 
and our positivity rate is down to 4.4 for the weekend in the 9th of March. Um, that's higher than England, a bit higher than England, which is 2.7, um, but it's lower than West Yorkshire, which is 5.3. Um, we, our highest ward is 150 per 100,000, and our lowest ward is um, 8.3. We've only got one ward across the borough now that's over 100 per 100,000, which is good. Um, and so we've seen decreases in a number of wards over the past uh, two periods, uh, particularly in Park, Elland and Calder. Um, our rate, the highest rate is, it continues to be the 18 to 24 year olds, and that's 157 per 100,000. Um, and as I say, it's in 100 per 100,000. Um, on Monday, that had a 74th highest of the English local authorities um, and 10th highest in Yorkshire and Humber. Um, and as I've said, at lowest in West Yorkshire. Um, the data does suggest to us that the, the rate will continue to fall in the coming days. Um, and we are still testing about the same number of people across the borough. Um, we are looking to, to put a local testing site somewhere in the lower valley. Um, and that in those discussions are ongoing, really. Um, and I think the reason why the figures are dropping, it's it's partly because of the lockdown. We've been in it for quite some time, but also the positive impact of the vaccination programme. Um, that, that's the, the, the usual... Just lo losing your Lily, is that all the information that you usually require? Councillor Lee, is that everything you need? Sorry. It's okay, Nam. Um, thanks, Karen. Just a couple of things. Um, on the testing, um, what was the percentage posit positive rate? Is that as well? 4.4. Four point four. Uh, and was I'll that put it lower? in the chat? And the other one, did did we mention the R? Yes. Sorry, what was it? I've not been mentioning the R for quite some time. It is below one, but I haven't got the up to date R, but it is below one at the moment. Okay, and and, and finally, the over sixty rate, you said it, it was forty eight and it was lower, but do you have the percentage figure by which it was lower? Please. Um, not, not on me, but I will email it to you on Monday if that's all right. Okay, thanks, Karen. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor okay. Lee. Uh, thank you, Karen. I'm, I'll take questions. So, Councillor Whitaker, please. Um, I was going to say, do you want me to do vaccination as well? Yes, yes, please, yeah, please, if go you don't first, have to. Yes, yeah, if you go first, yeah, if you go with the vaccinations, that'd be good, yeah. I think if you if you turn your video off, as much as we'd like to see your face, it might help if you, the connection might Sorry, help. Sorry, I can't. No. no, that's fine. That better? That, that's better, yeah. It's still not working very well. Okay, right. Do you want me to do vaccination as well? Yes, please. That would be most helpful. Thank you. Okay, so the, the second doses are starting um, this week and next in the primary care networks. And next week, the hospital will be starting the second vaccinations. So the second doses. Um, the vaccination supply was a bit low, but we're going to get Quite a, quite a bit next week, um, double what we had last week. Um, care home staff vaccinations are, are about 74%. So it is creeping up, which is good. Um, all health and social care staff altogether, um, the current rate is 82% have been vaccinated with their first doses. Um, we've invited over 10,000 carers to have their vaccinations. That's both formal and informal carers. Um, and this week, 
we were vaccinating taxi drivers um, in, in the in the uh, in the centre of Halifax, knowing that they're a, a very high risk group. Um, we went a bit early on that one, but that's that's absolutely fine. Um, and we've also started vaccinating the 56 to 59 and the 60 to 64. Um, so that that started as well. We had a, a vaccination session at the Ellen Mosque last weekend and managed to vaccinate 45 people, which was really good. Um, about half of those were, were members of the mosque and the other half was people from the local community, which was really, really good. Um, both catching catching people who use the mosque, but also getting the local community coming into the mosque um, to, to have that vaccination. Um, we're going to continue with doing some more pop-ups in the mosques. Um, and obviously we've got to think about Ramadan coming in April continue. So we're, we're thinking about that at the moment. Um, in terms of what does this mean? Well, I think as you know, we're doing well, the, the figures are, are, are reducing, um, but it's inevitable that as lockdown eases, we will probably see more cases again. Um, we're updating our, uh, updating our infection and outbreak plan at the moment. So we'll be focusing on supporting schools as they open more widely engaging with businesses, scaling up our community engagement, which we know works really, really well in Calderdale, um, and also looking at our uh, further localization of our, our local contact tracing support. Uh, vaccination program, we vaccinate those most uh, in need of the vaccination, and, and I lead a group that, that looks at each of the cohorts and making sure that we, we get the right cohorts through vaccination and obviously the communication that goes with that. So that's where we're at at the moment, Chair. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm struggling to hear people, I'm afraid, sorry. Yeah, no, no, thank you for, for trying your best in terms of the technology. Um, Councillor Whitaker, you have a question, I do believe. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Karen, uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Just wondering where um, where where we are with um, a vaccination hub in Brighouse. I know that the Council have been looking at sites um, do you have a date as to when that will be set up, uh, you know, set up and running? Um, it, it's a testing centre in, in Brighouse. It's not for vaccinations. The vaccinations are already happening in um, in that primary care locality. It's about an extra testing centre in, in Brighouse rather than for vaccinations. What we are looking at at the moment is around... Um, Perhaps having some more pharmacies uh, have doing vaccinations, and we are looking at a pharmacy uh, in the Brighouse area that, that could do that. Um, I think expressions of interest are in now, and we'll be making a final decision. I think we've got to make it this this week, um, and that goes back to the national centre for them to to progress that. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Uh, thank you. Um... As far as carers being vaccinated goes, how easy is, you know, we know that there's both formal and informal carers and that some people have more than one, one carer who, and it's obviously important that everyone involved with the, the care of an individual is, is, is vaccinated. Um, how easy is that to actually achieve in practice? Um, for these people to, to apply for it. And then I also wondered, given that it's great that case numbers are coming down, but that opens up a lot of opportunities then to consolidate the benefits that, we, that we've had, particularly in terms of stepping up, uh, finding, testing, and tracing, isolating and supporting people now is now is the time to actually be making sure that that's as good as we can possibly get it how is 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 that are we going to be doing anything different so that we can make it work this time when it when it didn't last because obviously we've been under special measures since the beginning of august Sorry, Chair, I didn't catch much of what council. I think Councillor Hutchinson, I think she's uh, sort of really struggling. Sorry, Councillor Hutchinson, I lost most of you on that. 
Okay, uh, shall I shall I do a, a, a quick synopsis, Chair? Something in the in the in the typing so that everyone in the public has heard what the question is. So if you type something in, I'm sure Karen will uh, will will have the time. I'm sure we'll finish in the next two whilst you type in. So just something very quickly on the on the typing element. Uh, I'll I'll bring Ian in at this stage, uh, please. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about this. Yeah. No, no. It's sorry one of those things. You can't, you can't be helps. No, no. It's Ian Baines. Yeah. Um, I'll try and deal with um, part of Councillor Hutchinson's question, which was the first part, which was around how successful do we think we are being being able to identify um, unpaid carers. So I think, as, as Karen said, we've recently just had to upload um, details of um, unpaid carers. And we did that um, yesterday. We had to do one data download yesterday and that's where the 10,000 figure comes from. There's a window of a, a few more days where we're trying to ensure that we've kind of exhausted all the possible avenues where information around a carer might be, where that might be someone that's been in receipt of a benefit relating to their, um, their carer role. We've got a carers network that has a lot of unpaid carers in there. Um, and we're making sure that we're using all our contacts across all organisations and the third set to make sure we've identified that. Um, we have been trying to debate about whether or not we could do something um, around just creating the focus on social media in order just to uh, ensure that we have reached as many people as possible. Um, we've probably gone a lot earlier than most places on unpaid carers. Um, so we've got an opportunity to try and enhance that number. So we'll continue, Councillor Hutchinson, to work to make sure that we identify as many people as possible who would define themselves as an unpaid carer. Thank you, Ian, for that. Do you want to give you uh, an update on your your um, your part? Okay. Yeah. Um, Karen's already talked a little bit about the um, vaccinations in uh, care homes and broader care settings, and the numbers are continuing to increase week by week. We're continuing to work with the workforce where they might have initially been hesitant and what we are seeing week on week is more people are coming um, back for the vaccine so that's really encouraging um, and I think as Karen said in residential and nursing homes it currently stands at 74 percent um, and we want to see that continue to increase. Um, we are seeing, continue to see a small number of outbreaks in care home settings. And currently there are um, five homes where there are an outbreak, where there's an outbreak which is, and an outbreak is defined by whether, a, whether there's one or more cases, whether that be staff or um, a resident. And I think, and I think this is in part, I think, part of Councillor Hutchinson's original question as well, which is, whilst we're seeing the uptake of vaccination being really, really um, positive, and it certainly is impacting and reducing the, the numbers of hospitalisation and deaths, what we yet don't know is how effective it is in terms of uh, impacting on transmission. So where we've got good uptake in care homes, we're still seeing some outbreaks. So I think what we need to do is make sure that as we move through um, this lockdown into the, through the roadmap, that the staking of that roadmap is really important that we don't, um, in releasing incrementally, that we don't see those numbers increase um, in, in the direction that we don't want them to go. So I think there is something about remembering that vaccine is a really important bit, but being able to keep test and trace is essential, but also where we can still stick with those very simple mes messages around hands, face and space. And as we get near into, this, into the warmer weather, although it doesn't feel like that today, is that whole part that ventil ventilation will play. And I think one of the things that Karen um, was emphasising was that where we are seeing workplace, uh, sorry, outbreaks, sorry, in, in, increased transmission, it's often 
in the working age adults in workplaces. So we have to kind of kind of double our efforts to make sure that whilst there's some really positive uh, messages on numbers, that we don't let go of those very simple messages that can actually protect each other and um, we can help ourselves get out of this situation. Thanks and thank you, Ian. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ian? On that, I can't see anyone raising any questions. So, okay, well, well yeah, no, thank you. Ian, would you like to come back here? Sorry, I, I, I just realised that one of the things that um, Karen has put in the chat, and I think, and I hopefully we caught this, which is the bit about, because we went earlier and paid carers, we've already started to vaccinate um, carers and paid carers. So that just takes us ahead of the game, I think. The other thing that we've... Um, been working with the CTG and partners on is for people with a learning disability it can be quite um, confusing and quite distressing to be in an environment that's quite busy quite um, and quite bright so there have been some very special um, specific clinics that are going to be set up that will be very different to the normal vaccination setup that will provide space for people with learning disabilities to continue to have vaccines in a safe space Again, I think that's just, again, we're trying to innovate and ensure that the vaccination process is, is a positive one for everybody. Thank you, Ian, for that. Someone else has put something in the chat room. It's got, um, did it, yeah. Um, so I'm just making sure we're not missing anything. I'll, I'll just read it out because it's easy. So it is in the public domain. And it, yes, we, we started vaccinating unpaid carers before the guidance came out. Uh, and Councillor Hutchinson, we are... Uh, increasing our um, visibility of engagement and we're about to put some media out around the importance of isolating. However, it's still, uh, it's still people who have to go out to work. Uh, so we continue to advertise and promote the support to people to isolate. So just for public knowledge on that, so everyone is aware what uh, what the response is. So thank you for that, uh, Karen. Um, I'm sorry you've had difficulties with the uh, connectivity as, as we appreciate. So I think nobody else has indicated to speak. So I'm going to end this item. So thank you for the update on that. We're heading in the right direction, hopefully. Um, so it goes on to item number seven, which is the work program. So it has been circulated. Uh, we continue to have updates. So anything to add, Alex, on that one? Yes, thank you, Chair. I don't have a great deal to add to the work program that I circulated recently. Um, that reflects um, the changes that were discussed uh, earlier last month, I believe, when we had a dedicated work program discussion uh, with officers. And that also provides um, quite a number of ideas uh, moving into the next municipal year as well. Um, the only thing I'd like to add is that myself and Mike had a conversation with the CCG recently uh, where Neil and Debbie suggested that Scrutiny may want to have a bit more of an in-depth look at the recently released NHS white paper and sort of some of the implications around that and just, um, yeah, have a bit more of a conversation about that, really. Mike may want to add a bit more to that. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So, uh, Mike, do you want to add a little bit more to that, very briefly? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, very briefly on that, Chair, yes, um, it's just a matter of, of when you think the, the timing will be right. Can I can I just come back to the issue of the um, um, decision, I think, that you took earlier on to invite the CCG and SWIFT to come back and talk about um, to talk about um, the, the, the street deaths issue? <clears throat> if we do that, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to just repeat what I said earlier, I suppose, but if we do that formally, um, we have to give them a date. If we invite them back to the next meeting, um, I've no doubt that's an issue that you'll want to discuss in some detail with the CCG and with and with SWIFT. Um, and the two items that you've currently got on the work plan, um, the social care market and the issue of uh, prevention and early intervention arising from your previous discussion about 42 Market Street, they're both substantial items. Um, so uh, if you... I think you just need to have a bit of a think about that. If you want Councillor Blackburn to write formally saying we're request, requiring you to attend um, to talk about the, um, the the streets deaths issue, then um, you'll have to give them a date. And, and the, the options for you are next meeting, April the 8th, uh, and then you've got two other substantial items on that agenda. Uh, wait until after the election and do it in June. Um, or arrange another meeting. 
Uh, okay, sh- sh- can we can we work? Uh, I'll, I'll work alongside Mike on that one, and and uh, and, and uh, Councillor Swift to to, yeah, to to find a a solution. So we we do get them uh, some way or the other, or the other. If you can give that into our our, our authorisation, I'm sure we can uh, come up with something that either is a, a special um, a special meeting with you know very brief. Well, not as brief. It's as long as it is, but it's a a, a one off meeting. Perhaps uh, might be. A, a, a good opportunity. So we're, we're still, it's still in the forefront of our, our, our questioning, I, I guess, in some ways. So if that's okay with members, is that okay? Yeah, superb. That's the end of the official uh, agenda. So, so thank you for your attendance this evening. Thank you for your questioning, and, uh, uh, and certainly, it's, it's, you know, it's been a very extremely useful, uh, extremely useful meeting once again. So, thank you, members, for for that, and uh, 